Welcome to Slash Forward. Magical zombies, the right arm of Satan, and a little bit of necrophilia thrown into the mix. Now safely down from the mountain, soul survivor Martin finds himself trying to stave off the destruction of a small rural town while avoiding blame for a mass murder committed by a horde of undead creatures who live in the snow. Are the rules of this universe internally coherent? We'll try to sort that out as we get into it right now. Let's get to it. We open, as is so often the case, at the end with Martin flashing back through his quaint winter break vacay, the quiet serenity rudely interrupted by an eruption of mountain zombies looking to get their claws on that beautiful Nazi gold, the pursuit of which elicited a full-blown assault on all fronts. Martin was bit, but took the necessary precautions to prevent any further spread, and after returning the gold, now only has to worry about whether he remembered to top off the tank. Plus, the zombies seeking out their final token. What? They really want to go four-player Ridge Racer at Dave & Buster's. He learns real quick how to drive a standard, providing a well-deserved dismembering as he goes. Luckily, there are bumper-like snowbanks to keep him headed forward while he focuses on cabin wrestling, plus oncoming traffic to help scrape off some of the riffraff. The semi-driver gets out and hopes to reduce his future manslaughter sentence by administering sloppy CPR, but he gets absolutely savaged. Herzog then arrives on scene and acquires his gold, but the logo. The fish knocks something loose in the back of his rotten mind. Meanwhile, Martin tries to keep driving well past his bedtime, which is really difficult. As a result, he misses his turn by a small margin. He wakes up on the stairway to heaven and is greeted by an angel, who actually congratulates him on his aliveness. The police, however, are more concerned with the murder axe they found up in the mountains with his fingerprints on it. Also, they know nothing of the strange creatures he speaks of. So little Nazi creatures came up from the earth. His explanation leaves something to be desired, but he's not going anywhere for now. In addition, the doctor is a certified bro. They found his arm preserved in the snow and reattached that bitch. Martin harshly yucks his young by freaking out about being imbued with Satan's arm, and they have to give him the good stuff to avoid hurting the doctor's feelings any further. At the outskirts of town, Jan is getting fully torqued on those milkmaids, commenting casually about his desire to receive head. His request is obliged, but Ed Kemper style. The crew move in to use this place for administering the return of Herzog's arm, a procedure conducted by a medical doctor, even though it clearly involves dark magic. So his degree is basically wasted here. That night, they visit the local World War II cemetery to see if they can summon forth reinforcements. But without the benefit of an icy bed of eternal peace, they're just too desiccated to rise up. That means they'll have to make their own corpses, as the priest finds out at the end of his shift. He attempts to run, but turns his ankle all the way around. But this is good. The church weeps at Herzog's defilement of the sacred grounds, which is strong evidence of an afterlife. This allows him to take his last communion fully at peace. But then his peace is disturbed when he is wrenched back to this ghastly mortal coil. The sense of this wakes Martin from his rest. He tries to shout warnings, but his credibility is shattered. Luckily, creepy Bobby's under the bed, creeping around and exploring the patient's bodies while they sleep. He took a picture of the grotesque appendage and sent it to the zombie squad, a trio of zombie apocalypse doomsayers he follows, and it's piqued their interest. Martin is delighted and begs him to summon them to Norway immediately. And also, if he helps him get out, he can use his weird arm to give him some chocolate. Once free, he breaks some bad news about the chocolate, and is left hoping he already notified the squad, because he is out, and very likely not coming back. He then gets caught red-handed. It's not what it looks like! But as it turns out, the hand has some latent instincts it acts upon, a talent for killing, and the ability to hotwire automobiles. He gets a call on Bobby's phone from a zombie enthusiast looking for more concrete info. Well, um, we came up to the cabin and uh, there was a bunch of... <laughs> Say no more. Given that the bitten are not turning, he assesses that these are cursed zombies looking to acquire a lost trinket or complete an unfinished task. Martin just has to identify their purpose, while Daniel has to convince the crew to fly halfway around the world on short notice. This is their chance to prove their naysayers wrong and do something actually productive and good for the world. But first, they need to prep by gathering information on Martin and Herzog 
from Norway. Whoa, hold on guys, we got ourselves a badass over here, in the form of Constable Gunga, who has to warm his room temp coffee in the microwave so it's not yucky in his mouth. He is thirsting for action in this podunk town, so when they get an APB for now infamous spree killer Martin Hickerud, his sole and primary purpose is now clear. Out at the airport, the whole gang's already here, hopping off the plane and immediately locking on to Martin's location. But first, they need their bags. And to acquire a variety of implements of destruction in the event the rumors are true. Hopefully they are true and that the exchange rate is good. At the same time, Martin is arriving at the World War II Museum, but is woefully underdressed for research. Thankfully, he stole an athlete's car, which apparently also had wet wipes, because he strolls up clean as a whistle. He allows himself a brief moment of sentimentality over his lost friends before heading in, and we see that his time is limited. Martin works hard to foster a gentler devil's arm, as Glenn hears a proud papa to three kittens who would suffer if he failed to return home. Cat Daddy takes him upstairs where he finds a convenient placard that explains Herzog's mission. Wipe out the entire town of Talfig as retribution for their part in embarrassing the Fuhrer. He begins trying to map out their approach, but doesn't need eyes to figure it out because his ears hear the wailing of the tourists outside. They slaughter the innocent, taking the parts that please them and putting others to good use where they can. Lucking out, the disguise skipped lunch, apparently. When all said and done, they recruit these poor hoes into their ranks. Then Herzog and the boys take a trip down memory lane, acquiring the battle map and armaments for their mission ahead. All the while, Glenn is pissing himself, hoping they don't notice his prohibited facial piercing. When the coast is clear, they emerge. There are only a few stragglers left behind, so Martin dusts off his dead arm and does a little limits testing. But what's the point? point of all this destruction. What good is this new power if it can only take and destroy? In a moment of reverence for the cycle of life, he inadvertently brings Jimmy back from the darkness. He giveth and taketh, before Daniel announces the arrival of the zombie squad, and still getting their legs under them in various ways. After formal intros, Martin is a bit wary of their small numbers, but it has to take what he can get. They recognize that Martin's gift is the answer to their problem. There was a Soviet brigade that was ambushed by Herzog in a frozen mountain choke point, and they may have some unfinished business that runs counter to Herzog's interests. They delegate tasks and split up, with Martin and Daniel going to summon Staverin, with loyal Jimmy in the backseat leaking all over their rental car. Meanwhile, the German unit is dozing its way into town. At the outskirts, a trio of young men get their chance to heroically warn the town of the impending disaster, but they're pretty dedicated to their sandbox project. The soldiers then storm the homes one by one, killing at will and with a degree of inspiration and creativity you mightn't have expected. With the revelation that the tank is sporting live shells, Glenn, Monica, and Blake observe the destruction from afar and try to devise a plan to slow their progression. Back at the museum, the authorities are just starting to catch up on what's going down, and all signs are pointing straight toward old Marty Hitherup. We then learn the gang's big plan is to try to lead the troops into the swamp to slow them down, then blow them up. Due to his nimble nature, Glenn has volunteered to show off his swamp running skills. He strolls right out onto the main road and makes quite a nuisance of himself, thus redirecting many of them from the main group. Unfortunately, he's not really that fast a runner, and this isn't actually much of a swamp. Still, they mostly get the job done. The celebrations are short-lived, however, when they realize that Herzog and the others don't have to come to them and so much as shoot at them from afar. At the station, Gunga casually robs the recently deceased. He then takes news that the special forces group has run into a delay as a sign that he's meant to step up here and prove his mettle. While at the mountain pass, they're really hoping that since Martin is summoning the zombies, they'll all obey him like Jimmy. They soon arrive at the site of the mass grave and Martin is encouraged to hellboy these crusty bitches back to life. Luckily, the power is sort of an instinctual thing. It's a tense few moments as the bodies rise up from the floor, but then it is confirmed that Martin's recognized as the zombie dom. Herzog and crew roll into the quiet town, and news of their arrival distracts the Martin Apprehension Junior Task Force from their goal, but does afford them the opportunity to lock and load. When Herzog arrives in the town square, Martin meets him on the field of battle and informs him that the town has been evacuated. So, if you think about it, the mission 
runs over, but he is not budging, so Martin reveals that he's holding onto Herzog's arm, then dramatically calls forth his Soviet forces. The two opposing units have a brief standoff before colliding violently in Braveheart-style combat. Amidst the pablum, Herzog sends off the tanks to do tanky stuff, and then faces down his adversary. Despite the size difference, they are very capable and well-matched combatants. Then the cops roll up, but as they attempt to make sense of the breathtaking scene, the tank veers off in their direction. With only one way out that's still six-eighths blocked off, only a few of them escape in time. After this shameful embarrassment, the survivors take refuge in a nearby residence to sort out what's up with these crazy-ass LARPers. They're going so hard! And with live steel, Daniel then arrives and demonstrates that practicing ninja moves in the mirror is a viable training strategy that transfers over perfectly to real-life situations. It even inspires Jimmy to get in on this action, and he comes fired up. When the remainder of the squad finally shows up, it's just in time to witness the downfall of the Russian leader. Oh man, he was their favorite. Then Monica realizes, somehow, that this is a Queen Bee situation. The grunts require the master for locomotion. If the master goes, they all revert back to fertilizer. Now, this does not require Martin to engage with Herzog, but he does. Realistically, this puts them all at extreme risk, as he is the master of the opposing force. Nevertheless, <laughs> He does reasonably well right up until he gets his face turned into a flapjack. He needs to turn this around, as on the battlefield, the zombie squad is soon down to three combatants. Well, two, after Glenn gets a little pez hole opened up on his neck. Meanwhile, Daniel's been doing work inside the tank, trying to get it under human control. As it veers wildly, it provides a reset for the main fight, while also giving final closure to young Jimmy's redemption arc. Martin is able to wail on Herzog up until they come to an abrupt stop, then distract him with a staring competition. Luckily for the girls, their enemies really enjoy slow rolling their victims when they're able, because it takes a good bit of time for Daniel to adjust his aim and eventually turn her song into a little bloody fountain. This does, in fact, bring down the hive. The celebration, however, is tempered by the remembrance of those they've lost along the way. Then they wander off to convalesce while still within the purview of the Norwegian Commonwealth Fund. The police emerge from behind their curtains to consider doing some police work. While Martin ponders what the next chapter in his life will be, he ultimately opts to put his dead arm to good use and bring back his grandma. Oh, it's Hannah's grave that he knew the location of innately. She is a bit worse for the wear, but still remains a perfectly serviceable companion. And finally, faithful Jimmy eventually strolls up to bask in the glow of true love's embrace. I forgot this one was a direct sequel to the first, in that the events pick up right where the first one leaves off. We are reminded through brief flashback, but as a full refresher, Martin and friends were in a cabin up in the mountains. They happened upon what they took to be hidden treasure. It was actually plundered Nazi riches. This activated the nearby zombie horde, which had been dormant and well-preserved by the year-round cold environment. You can imagine what ensues, and Martin was the sole survivor of that event. They talk about it more in this installment, since there's a lot more time to flesh out the mythos. But these zombies are based on Scandinavian folklore. They're not standard, straightforward zombos. That's why they were more based on magic and cannot be dispatched through the usual means. They are motivated by pursuit of a trinket or goal. So after acquiring the last of their gold, they were reminded of the final mission they were undertaking when wiped out, and continued on that mission. During the war, the town of Talbig had provided intel and support to Allied troops that resulted in the sinking of a major German battleship, which was a personal affront and embarrassment to Hitler. So Herzog was on a mission of pure wartime revenge with no other tactical objective. The ambush and destruction of Staverin's troops was a separate event that happened sometime prior. It was just a convenience that this incident in the Soviet mission at the time happened to align with the group's needs. Honestly, reattached limbs usually look pretty funky, so it was not immediately obvious that the arm attached to Martin was Herzog. They did spell it out pretty clearly throughout the movie. It's also not totally clear whether Herzog had Martin's arm. The arm they attached was a little too young to be the homeowner's, and there was a moment of recognition when the two adversaries first saw each other. But Herzog's arm is the meaningful appendage here. Also, I'm not sure if it was totally clear, but the police were pursuing Martin because evidence of his involvement was all over all of the murder scenes. But also, in the original, he is the actual killer of his girlfriend Hannah. When he was going beast mode, she crept up behind him, and he instinctively swung his axe around and caught her in the neck. 
so they were spurred on by an actual murder that he committed. I chose this one over the original because it's a sequel that's rated higher than its predecessor, which is interesting. Although, I'm not sure this is warranted. The pair of movies sort of reminds me of the It remakes. The first one is fresh and new and highly enjoyable. Then, based off that success, they try to make a sequel that accentuates the few core elements the filmmakers think resonated with the audience. In It, it was the humorous, irreverent dialogue of the kids, which was way overdone in the sequel. It's like that with Dead Snow as well. Everything was on a larger scale, but almost too large at times. It's not that the humor was overstated, the CPR stuff and young Jimmy were great, but other elements like the zombie squad came off a little sweaty. They were really working hard there. They tried to give Monica a personality by making her a Star Wars fan, but every reference she made was just crammed in there, indelicately and unlubricated, which is a crass way to put it, but that's just what it felt like. And that's them, not me. This also caused them to push things too far in terms of the mechanics of all this. I don't remember if the characters tried to employ the standard tropes in the first one, and that's why Martin cut his arm off? If so, then that's a decent explanation. If not, then there was no reason for him to do that. But then also, how do they actually kill the zombies? Headshots don't work, also they made the mistake of showing the magic can work over and over and over again. So why was either side ever short on zombie combatants? Why would an axe to the spine take down Staverin? Jimmy was in a wheelchair as a human, but walking as a zombie. He got run over by a tank and was still going. I know the Jimmy part is for humor, but the problem is that the other parts are purely for convenience. You have to follow the rules of the universe you created. Taking this route calls into question the usefulness of all their efforts. They could have instead played around with the body part reattachment element of the magical zombies. That could have been interesting. Another aspect of the movie that accentuates this is that they go out of their way to put in long tracks of expositional dialogue that are meant to sort out how everything works here in terms of the hand summoning the dead, the magic rather than viral aspect of the undead, etc. But then things like this being a queen hive scenario among other major plot points are glossed over. This is only exacerbated when you try really hard to explain everything up front. Explanations become the expectation. Otherwise, this was a very entertaining movie. I'm not sure I would place it above the original. The original had a more intimate and creepy vibe to it. This one was much more out in the open and brighter. It didn't always work to see it on this large of a scale, but they did definitely ramp things up. And it wasn't just a bunch of indecipherable movement and confusion. There were a lot of creative little beats injected into the action sequences that made them very memorable and worthy of the splatter designation. Also, I was surprised to find that they did dual audio tracks on this movie. I'm not sure I've ever run across this before, but I typically go original track with subbies, because the dubbing is never as good. I went to compare these and was surprised to find the actors' voices were in both, but the English track was not dubbed. It was in English on set. So I guess they did everything twice? And that definitely gives the feel of being created by someone who's putting some thought and care into what they're producing. Fans of Splatter Gore will be very happy with this movie, and even if you're easily grossed out but like zombie-themed stories, I think this one would be okay. There are pretty significant overtones of humor applied throughout, so it's not too bad. It's also a must-watch for zombie aficionados, especially in this saturated market. Dead Snow does offer up something a little different from the standard fare. The sequel did start like the first episode of a new season of television with its recap of the prior season's events. However, I would still probably recommend watching the first one first. I think that one's more satisfying overall, and when you feel like you want more, the sequel delivers in abundance. Now that we're here, I wanted to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.